Take a look at your life and slow down For me to you Slow down, slow down, slow down Look how life is passing Take a look at your life and slow down For me to you Slow down, slow down, slow down Look how life is passing Take a look at your life and slow down Mute that audio. Good evening, good neighbors. Welcome to another virtual slow roll. Seamus here with India Walton, live and direct, not in Buffalo. Good evening, India. Good evening. And uh, we are here uh, as we are now every Thursday night at 8 p.m. On our website, slowrollbuffalo.org, showing ride highlights from this past Monday's ride, continuing the conversations and welcoming a bunch of guests. And tonight's, uh, this week's ride, and our guests for tonight are coming to us from Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper. This is our second annual Waterkeeper ride. Shout out to Independent Health, our presenting partner since 2015, for helping keep the wheels rolling here, especially in 2020. Uh, when we've had to make so many changes, we'll talk about some of them over the course of the night. Uh, but here we are off and running with our Waterkeeper ride, off and rolling. And uh, I ha I'm not quite in mid-season form on the ride here uh, because I forgot to turn on the GoPro until there we were at the corner of East Ferry and Colorado. <laughs> As I was joking with squad member Jessica Kruger there on the left, mid-season form. I'm in mid-season form. Uh, and I, of course, was not. Uh, <laughs> I had to turn on the GoPro, but we started from the Northland Workforce Training Center. Uh, a good reason tied to our waterkeeper, my Niagara waterkeeper. And that was something. Yeah. Cool. Uh, pardon me that my audio is not working well. I hope that improves it. Video, that's right. Um, so we have. Uh, this route that's 12 miles and touches uh, the Niagara River, the Buffalo River before that, but starts at Northland Workforce Training Center on Northland Ave on the east side, which is uh, news to uh, some, including me just a few years ago, we really learned this through Waterkeeper, that that part of Buffalo is on top of the Skajakwita Creek. The Skajakwita Creek was buried uh, through the east side of Buffalo and comes up uh, at Forest Lawn Cemetery. There. Don't I look better now, India? <laughs> you already look great, but we were talking about this last week. Yeah. That, was, that was news to you that the uh, Jackter Creek was buried under the east side, right? Yeah. So since I've been... Um doing more social justice work, especially as it relates to land and uh, relationship that we have to land and access to water. Um, I'm very interested in the dynamics of how folks on the east side um, are kind of denied access to water, even on the west side, right? When we look at how our built environment um, sort of blocks us away from the water, I was very shocked to learn that the Skajakwita was actually buried under the east side. Um, so where you have who, who won't necessarily venture to the outer harbor or, or LaSalle Park um, or down to the river, it's interesting to know that like underneath all of these paved streets, um, it is 
Well, shucks, we're struggling with India's feed there. Um, but uh, she's right on. Uh, this is a lot of, of the work of Waterkeeper right now uh, is that educational component. Um, and so to illuminate that, uh, let's bring in the, the, the guy who taught me that about the buried Skajakwita Creek, the Director of Community Engagement for Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper, Chris Morosky. Come on in, Chris. All right. Hi, Seamus. Welcome. Hi, India. <laughs> Say hello to frozen India. Uh, so hopefully we can get India back. Uh, in the meantime, as we head east, uh, westbound on East Ferry, uh, heading toward Humboldt will be our next turn. Um, Chris, thanks again uh, for all your support over the years and, uh, and especially here with uh, uh, having another waterkeeper ride, even under the limited circumstances with all the changes that we've had to make. We, we really believe in the mission and the work of Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper and, and appreciate this opportunity to partner and, and, and really just illuminate all the work beginning with this education. So uh, let's start there. Uh, so the, the fact that we are riding along an area where we are, where the Skajakwita Creek is underground, right? Yeah, definitely. And uh, Jameis, thanks so much for being with us and for hosting, you know, us uh, once again, second annual, hopefully it'll be a annual tradition. Um, and I just want to uh, say really quick for those that just aren't as familiar with Waterkeeper. So we're a nonprofit organization, community-based. We've been around for 30 years, and our mission is to restore and protect all the waters. Um, and when I say all the waters, I mean all the tributaries to the Niagara River, um, the Buffalo River, and of course, our beloved little Equita Creek that is near and dear to my heart. And Yes, we are indeed traveling in uh, the east side of Buffalo, uh, where the creek is buried underground in a large tunnel uh, from pretty much the city line at uh, near Villa Maria College, and uh, goes under, flows underneath the, the holy side and comes out just on the other side of Main Street uh, in Forest Lawn Cemetery. That's so, and a lot of, um, we're working on, so Skidjapoda Creek to us is the, kind of the next step uh, in restoration after, you know, a lot of success with the Buffalo River, uh, which isn't fully restored, still has some work to go, but uh, we're, we're moving to Skidjapoda Creek and we're looking to restore, you know, the entire with, with a large plan, uh, restoration, and that includes, um, the upper kind of headwaters of Skidjapoda Creek that begins in the, some of the suburbs of uh, Lancaster. So we flow through Lancaster to Pew, um, underneath the Galleria Mall as well, uh, which is another place where it's buried underground that a lot of folks don't know about it actually. Uh, the Galleria Mall was built on one of the last remaining wetlands uh, in the watershed. And, and I'll just explain the, importance of wetlands really quick. Um, wetlands are, are a place that can provide flood storage, can provide refuge for fish and amphibians and reptiles and birds, native species, and it also cleans, helps clean the water. So wetlands are really important. And the fact that we kind of built a big mall for the last remaining one is a pretty sad thing. So a lot of, a lot of work to do on that creek. Indeed, and and Waterkeeper is at the forefront of this in so many ways. Uh, as we continue to head on ferry, that we'll be turning on Humboldt in a second here. Uh, note what a beautiful night it was, uh, and this ride into the sunset, which will be a running theme. The end of the ride will just catch the sun uh, disappearing into the horizon, and that will be a theme here for the next couple weeks. Uh, but uh, great, great job, Chris, and on all the help on this route. Uh, we really, as we've, we've always uh, said, the, the route is one of the, the most fun parts of Slow Rolled, making the route before everyone even gets to ride on it, all the work that goes into that. Shout out to uh, the folks in the Department of Public Works at City Hall who, who respond to uh, the many needs 
along the way of the route. For, for example, as we turn right onto Humboldt here, um, a lot of glass on Humboldt. We, what it, it needs more than what they did though. Um, what's going on here is so many folks parked on the right and there's so much glass along here. And really what they could use is, is a street sweeper all along there, uh, but we, and that they would have to have some temporary do not stand uh, but we do want to recognize that there were a, maybe about 15 or 20 parts of this route that uh, that we, we asked for attention. As we've been saying in recent weeks, as anyone can do, call 311, call the Department of Public Works, call City Hall, call the mayor, call your councilman when there are issues with your street. Uh, where there were plenty of them on this route, and uh, they were pretty responsive this week. As we're going north now on Humboldt, uh, it's interesting to note these beautiful houses on Humboldt, uh, that horrible highway to the left. This used to be a beautiful tree-lined parkway. It was really one of the, the arteries of the city. It was part of the lungs of our city as Olmsted uh, designed them uh, from. This would be the connector on Humboldt Parkway from uh, MLK Park to Delaware Park. As we go over here, uh, go under this pedestrian overpass, this is along Northland. Uh, and... Chris, uh, when I rode that on my way over, I saw a cleanup crew, and uh, I think that's a great way to mention, uh, we were right over the creek at this point, but to mention uh, the work that Waterkeeper does with cleanups. You had a bunch of folks out on, uh, on this night. Yeah, we were doing, um, you know, obviously Waterkeeper has, uh, shoreline cleanup is what we've been doing for about 25 years. Um, Unfortunately, there's still litter <laughs> like in the waters and on the shoreline and in our neighborhoods 25 years later. Um, so uh, we we have a sh summer shoreline sweep going, which we had to cancel our big spring shoreline sweep with the 2,000 volunteers and 40 sites and a big after party um, with uh, the bats. And uh, we had to cancel that due to COVID, but we're doing um, individual sweeps and small group sweeps like all summer pretty much so we have it set up to where you can register with us to pick up supplies and you could do a cleanup anywhere um, on the shoreline or in a park or in your neighborhood because all the uh, plastic and litter could eventually make its way to the water through the stormwater system so anywhere we could pick up litter in the not only is it cleaning up you know, obviously do find the neighborhood, but it's also preventing it from eventually making its way into the water. And the crew, we're in partnership with um, the Niagara River Greenway Commission, Go Bike, um, and the uh, the REACH project, the folks that are working on uh, um, health, racial uh, health equity in the ferry corridor, That's Mr. Stan Martin and his crew. We're out there helping and uh, just did, we tried to do a cleanup around kind of like the underground portion of Skujakwita. So they had four groups, um, one in Hamlin Park uh, at the start at Lake Nirkanisius and then one near Northland and then uh, one down Ferry and at Colorado Street and Skujakwita Street area. So it just coincided nice with the slow roll we were over there. Really did, and and unfortunately, since I messed up by not not starting uh, the camera until we were a few blocks in, missed that portion where again to just to drive that point home that the Skajakwita Creek is buried underground on the east side. We rode to starting from Northland, and again, uh, shout out to the Northland crew, uh, Art Hall uh, from Budsey, and the, uh, so much great work happening on, on Northland Ave. And they hosted the, the after party for this cleanup with a dinner at Manor Restaurant. Uh, we rode from Northland to Grider to Skajakwita Street. There's a Skajakwita Street in the heart of the east side that goes from Grider to Colorado. Um, and it's because it's above the creek. And, and so what we missed there actually by not showing that was uh, some of the other work that Waterkeeper is doing in that area, not just underground with the water, but uh, about air quality, correct? Um, no, I think, well, so what we're talking about, uh, I think, Seamus, what you're alluding to is the, um, the American Axle site. So, uh, the American Axle, the former American Axle plant is over there in that Delavan and Grider neighborhood, and, and it's currently right, uh, under the Brownfield cleanup program. 
and it's going through a interim remedial work plan. And the clean shout out to the Clean Air Coalition. Um, they've been organizing with the neighbors in that neighborhood for for quite a long time. I think since 2015. Um, and they really want they want to have a rigorous uh, you know health centered cleanup over there. Um, we got to talk about this little this little beautiful street that we went down, Seamus, while we're going down it, though. This is, this is great over here. Yeah, this is a part of, uh, uh, of Slow Roll that we really couldn't do with 1,500 people. Uh, we're in Hamlin Park now, uh, so we're making a left onto Viola Park, this beautiful one-block street, brick roads. We normally don't roll on brick roads, but smaller groups here. Uh, so... Uh, uh, this is just a just a little tucked into Hamlin Park with this nice park in the center, uh, a beautiful street. Uh, big love to George Scott from the Colored Musicians Club, uh, who is a, a longtime resident here of Viola Park. And so we did this little detour to ride this one block Viola Park, uh, turn right these streets in Hamlin Park, uh, Daisy and Pansy. Uh, and, and uh, so many folks out on the right there uh, every time we were along the route. And, uh, and then there's another park as we get back. We were on Florida, so we're going to return to Florida. Um, and, and so you'll see here, when we turn back onto Florida, along the left is uh, a pretty wide trail. And as we make this right, the, the trail will eventually cross over to the other side of Florida into another little park uh, and uh, that again um, this is we're essentially on Skajakwita Creek right Chris yep you got it uh, through Hamlin Park uh, Florida Street is essentially this part uh, where the Skajakwita Creek is and it actually flows underneath pretty much behind the Hamlin Park Elementary School um, that is uh, it's the kind of bandage we it gets its way to Florida. And then where you rode over Northland, that overpass near Northland, that's basically where it crosses under the 33, like that, that, over, that pedestrian overpass. And then continues kind of, uh, there is a little path. There's actually a lot of city owned property on the, the right of way of the creek. Um, so there are some, there's sidewalks and it seems maintained. Um, and there's like some path, parts where there's not sidewalks, but there's like kind of like just human, you know, herd, herd paths you would call it like making, you know, like uh, people making their own path through the grass. Um, and it's like a natural kind of trail that that is a possibility, you know, in the future, if, if that's what like the neighborhood would like. There it is right there to the right. Yeah, so that's the one that cuts, that's by um, the student, the mattress factory, right? Correct. And yeah. that's cut kind of towards Canisius, and it actually flows under, I can't remember exactly where, I think maybe the athletic field or the parking lot of the athletic field. I have, mm -hmm. have to look at the map again. But, and then, you know, very close after that, it comes out at Forest Lawn. And that's Preservation Studios on the right there. Our friends there have some photos of what it used to look like uh, before uh, it was buried right here at Florida and Jefferson. I hope uh, before we make this left onto Jefferson, we're going to uh, head south on one of the main streets of the east side and work our way to the Buffalo River. Indy, are you back with us? <laughs> Maybe we see, but don't hear India. Yeah, I can see her below. She looks like like she's with us, but I can't hear. I'm here. I might join from my cell phone. It doesn't matter where I am in the world. I always seem to have these connectivity issues. Plus, I have the distraction of my teenager kind of running around behind I, me. I saw him there. Well, tell us where you are. It's, I'm it's exciting. So Sorry. Uh. <laughs> Shucks, it's hard to talk over folks in this virtual format. Appreciate everybody's patience at home. India, we want 
we want to know, we want you to share where you are, but we're going to have to wait till she comes back. India is in an exciting place right now. Uh, but for now, the virtual slow roll is heading south on Jefferson. Uh, so we were right at the edge of Canisius College, as you noted there, Chris, and uh, right at that spot, one of our regular riders, Janelle Brooks from Libby's Lemonade, was saying, you know, bragging about Canisius, we're both Canisius grads. Uh, but when I was a student at Canisius, I used to ride Jefferson in its entirety to get down to work at the ballpark for Bison's games. Jefferson goes from Main Street, uh, right at Canisius College in Hamlin Park, down to Swan Street on the edge of the hydraulics. You make a right and you're about a mile from downtown. So we're gonna take this almost all the way to Swan, one, one street short, and turn on Hamburg and make our way into the first ward all the way to the entirety of Hamburg where we'll end at the, uh, at least end this portion, at the Buffalo River and Mutual Riverfront Park. India, are you back? I think so. Can you hear me? Yes, please tell us where you are and why. <laughs> oh, gosh. Here, <laughs> let me just do this. I'm just I'm gonna join from my phone because I'm pretty sure I'll get a better connection than the hotel Wi-Fi. Sure thing. Uh, <laughs> so much suspense for where India is. It's gonna be good, I promise. <laughs> um, but so here, Jefferson and Ferry. Uh, Chris, at, in the meantime, while India gets dialed back in, uh, we have another guest that's waiting patiently who you've introduced us to already on our website and on the ride. And uh, why don't you... Uh, bring our guest in here now. Yeah, great. Um, before before I do that, I just want to talk about quickly, um, hi, Helen, hi. <laughs> before I introduce <laughs> Helen to the know. Um, so, you know, Waterkeeper, um, you know, we, we work to provide access to water and we talked about with India already how, you know, the east side, because of the, the with the, the creek being buried, since the 1920s, the entire east side of Buffalo really does not have a water, you know, a waterfront that, um, and because we live in, you know, I, I think it's like the sixth most, or one of, one of the top 10 of segregated cities, um, especially, you know, the black community is, does not have access to water equitably. Um, and the environmental movement in general, um, along with other science, technology, engineering, math, um, professions is lacking in diversity of folks um, and it's it's a big issue and in the environmental movement uh, a lot of, of mainstream organizations smaller organizations are you know coming with a reckoning with that and, and rec recognizing it um, and recognizing that you know we our work has to be has to be tied in with anti-racism work um, we can't have a clean environment while people are living with these these vast inequities that we have in our country it's all it's all tied together um climate change climate justice just transition you know clean water it's all it's all a thing that we have to deal with um and we need everybody like i said when we introduced the the uh to the, the crowd there on monday and we when i say everybody i mean everybody of, of, of all backgrounds, not just not just white people, um, not just white suburban college educated people as are most of you know the people that work in the environmental movement, the people that volunteer for it. Um, so we're focusing, we're recognizing that we're we're having difficult conversations internally, um, externally, and we we have to do that. We have to bring everybody in and we have to that's just not just uh, breaking down barriers to you know, academics, um, but also making people feel welcome, making pe people feel safe in outdoor spaces. So there's a lot to do. Um, and we'd love to bring in Helen and uh, introduce her. So I, I met Helen uh, this last semester, her, her last semester before she graduated uh, from University of Buffalo. And she was an intern for us and she did a lot of work um, a lot of different things but she did a lot of work with brownfields um, opportunity act and, and a lot of sites 
Um, but what, what was it? What was amazing about Helen um, that what she did is I'll let her you know tell her story and introduce her group. But she's um, she actually started her own nonprofit like in the time between when she graduated and now. So she, she's on her way, um, and and I'll, she'll tell that background. And it's exactly what I was talking about of of, of the lack of of diversity in environmental in the STEM fields, and, and Helen is um, Helen's trying to do something about that. So, um, Helen Toledo, welcome to the, the slow roll. And I don't know if I'll stay on or if I'll get taken off while you're on. <laughs> All right, thank you, Chris, and thank you for that incredible introduction. And to kind of segue off of what he said about the diversity and inclusion factor and um, environmental injustice and sustainability. My my struggle has always been with accessibility and representation. And as I discussed with Chris the other day, having representation for not only minorities but just women in STEM in general. So um, I I am I did create my <laughs> an organization called Be Well. It stands for Buffalo Women of Environmental Learning and Leadership, and um, our mission is to encourage women to explore the natural environment, promote sustainability, and develop leadership skills through environmental stewardship and community engagement. And I'm extremely grateful for my time at Waterkeeper because that really solidified where I think my niche is in the environmental movement and making sure that we are spreading this awareness and, like Chris said, making sure that everyone is involved, not just um, you know, communities that can afford that higher education. I want to make sure we can reach out to people that may not have had those opportunities to be educated about the environment and becoming passionate about it and realizing it's not just going out in the woods, but it's your, literally your neighbors and being in your backyard. So um, thank you for having me on here today. I just, I really hope you all can um, be involved with both Be Well and Waterkeeper. We have a, a website and a Facebook page, and I'm sure Seamus has shared it already, but we have lots of events coming up and we'd love to have absolutely everyone involved. Yeah, I'm super excited um, for all of the things you have lined up. <laughs> I am like 100% like your quintessential stereotypical like East Side girl, like <laughs> ill outside, like ill bugs, like no water, mm. stay away. And um, I had the opportunity to spend some time in Vermont where I was like thrust into this world of just like outdoors and nature and something clicked, right? Like mm -hmm. we deserve these types of things too. So I'm super excited to like be able to get with you and interact with you and learn all, all about environmentalism. I want to get in a kayak. I think that like <laughs> the events you have planned are like super exciting and holistic. Um, can you. you just like run down some of like what you have going on over the next month or so? Yeah, of course. We have tons coming up in September. Um, so our next event's going to be September 5th. We're doing a nature walk at Tiff Nature Preserve. Um, I'm really looking forward to our event after that. September 12th, we're doing a, a gardening event with Friends of Broderick Park, which Chris knows all about. <laughs> he could probably give you more information than me. And then um, it's not just the environmental factor. I also really wanted to tie in self-wellness and making sure that even though you're advocating for your environment and your community, you're making sure you're advocating for yourself as well and making sure that you are healthy. So um, along with, we're going to have some seminars coming up. They aren't fully planned yet, but they're in the works. Um, at the end of September, we are going to have a, a yoga session in the morning to because I, I think it's super important to take that time and make sure that you're you're mentally healthy as well. So, um. I love that. We, you know, there's a narrative um, sometimes in our community. I know lots of Black environmentalists, but there's a narrative sometimes in our community that like environmentalism is not our concern. Mm -hmm. But when we think about the negative impacts of environmental change and, degrad and degradation, it hits our communities first and yep. it hits them hardest, right? When you look at the Flint water crisis, who are the people who were stuck with the disgusting, toxic mm -hmm. water, right? It was poor people and people of color. Um, when the climate change disaster happens, those who have 
are going to just move to somewhere else. And mm -hmm. the people who don't have those resources are going to be stuck. So we really have a vested interest in being more concerned about how we treat our planet and how we treat ourselves, because ultimately yeah. our survival is dependent upon how healthy we are as individuals and as a community and how healthy we're able to keep our environment. So, mm -hmm. and, and as Chris was talking, up. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much. And as Chris was talking about before the, the brownfields, um, a lot of my personal research is tying in GIS with brownfield restoration techniques. And you can take a look at these maps and see that the brownfields in Buffalo are in the, um, you know, socioeconomic areas that are not as, as prosperous. So just tying that into the environmental movement and, and making people realize and educating them that this is closer than just watching the news and finding out what you can do to, to help yourself and your family and friends. Awesome work. <laughs> Thank you. And Helen, this is born out of, uh, I, I think this is relevant to just keep discussing. Uh, as you mentioned, there's a, a great uh, exchange with Helen on our website, slowrollbuffalo.org. Just get to know Helen Toledo. And we had a wonderful conversation uh, that much of which uh, is transcribed uh, in, into the news section of our website. Uh, this is uh, not necessarily something that like, you know, you said when, when I grow up, I want to start my own STEM wellness organization. Oh, yeah, this is something that this is this is something that was like kind of a, a rapid response to some adversity in your life, right? That you turned into form this nonprofit. Yeah, and 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 a close friend of mine always said to to take the negatives in your life and turn into something positive. And not being able to obtain leadership positions, having the experience, having the education and being constantly turned down um, and just, you know, the everyday adversities that women of color experience and especially being in a STEM related field, there's, there's a lot thrown at you that a lot of people aren't aware of. So out of me trying to find a way to make myself stick out and, you know, have a better resume and, and be that one up, I guess, I, I wanted to make sure that I could help other women and just helping the community in general and like not just being completely selfish about it, but finding a way to have tie everyone in, involved and, and get them excited about these conversations. And like Chris said, having those uncomfortable conversations and making them the norm. So I think that's the first step to, to any type of advocacy is talking about it. Well, it's remarkable to, uh, as you are stepping out into the real world, uh, fresh out of college, on your way to uh, your uh, master's degree, that you said, so as you're advocating for yourself, you have this presence of mind to uh, advocate for others as well, and, and, and not just speaking out, but forming uh, a 501c3 nonprofit. And you have... Uh, you're established with the board of directors included. This is all on your on the Be yeah. Well website, right? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And um, I, I'm just grateful more than anything. And it's, it's not even like to brag about it. It's it's amazing to see how the Buffalo community can come together for something good. Like it's it's far too often you look on the news and see, you know just all the negativity in your community. And once I started speaking out about this and what I was trying to do and what I was trying to form, I thought it was going to be a lot of cold calling and, hey, do you want to do this? But it, I started receiving like random emails and messages and like, this is awesome. I want to be involved. I've been looking for something like this. So really just having that that friends and family and safe space to to advocate for what's what's better for everyone. So... Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome i love i love creators like I, I i i am very drawn to people who like have some sort of personal adversity or turmoil and like turn it into this grander vision that like creates a solution to that so i'm like totally girl crushing on you i'm like this is so awesome. <laughs> thanks <laughs> no, me, me and you gotta, we gotta talk sometime. I mean, we're talking now, but in more detail, absolutely.
We should, we certainly, <laughs> certainly do. That's what we're here for. And I love how right at the end of the ride, uh, I don't think it'll be on camera, but uh, riding up front with us here, like you just graduated from UB, you're, uh, you're on to grad school at Buff State, working uh, at Duville, and right riding next to me is one of our squad members, our volunteers, uh, Jessica Kruger, professor at, at UB. And we're, and actually she's done, Jessica's done a lot of work right here. Uh, we're at Jefferson and William, uh, and going next street will be Clinton. Um, and we're doing Eastside Health Clinics. And that's how we met Jessica, but because she started riding with Slow Roll and Eastside Bike Club and bringing her students to say, if you're going to work uh, on the east side, we're not just going to show up for this uh, school work. Um, we're going to immerse and connect with the community. And, and she's become such a force uh, on Slow Roll. And she <laughs> right at the end of the ride is like, oh, you're Helen, I wanna talk to you. Let's work together. <laughs> and like, so uh, we, are, we are here for that. It was really wonderful to see. Uh, we, while we go to Jefferson and Clinton, uh, we also, Want to recognize? I, I hope we we can bring on as as a guest again this week before this live stream is through. Uh, we're into the neighborhood where George Johnson grew up here, a founder of the East Side Bike Club, president of Buffalo United Front. Uh, he grew up here. Uh, coming up on the right at Jefferson and Clinton will be the Frederick Douglass uh, Towers, uh, part of the Buffalo Municipal Housing Authority. Uh, and George not only grew up here. The street behind it is named after his mother, uh, Mary Johnson, for all, all of the uh, advocacy that she has done. Um, and we we rode there with Eastside Bike Club. We talked about it last week when we did a feature on George, just like we did a feature uh, on, on you, Helen, to get to know George Johnson. Uh, Chris, uh, if we can tease a little bit of that, uh, uh, because I know we want to talk about this at the end, but uh, this is so tied together. Uh, you've been working with George as as Helen mentioned with the Friends of Broderick Park. Yeah, and let, let me just say about Helen. So a couple of weeks ago, maybe like, no, it's more like a month, maybe a month and a half ago, we had a meeting about forming a nonprofit because, you know, George and I are working to form a nonprofit for Friends of Broderick Park. That's fun. You know, giving Helen some tips and stuff. And she's like ahead of us already <laughs> and with her nonprofit. And she's got a website, she's got merch. <laughs> Uh, fanny packs and mugs, nice. and t-shirts, and like what? It took us like twenty-five years to have merch. <laughs> literally, like it took us so long, and she just did it like immediately. So I, I gotta get her thanks, off. Chris. <laughs> Being ahead of the game. So, um, but yeah, so George is um, George knows everybody. Everybody knows George, <laughs> you know. So, um, but yeah, I've been I've been working with him just because uh, you know Waterkeeper was part of the. Uh, broader park restoration, the uh, revamping the park back in uh, 20, 2012. And we, there was a, a group, Friends of Broderick Park, form to inform like about the, the design of the park and you know stakeholder input. And then kind of just after the park was done, unfortunately, the park was closed the whole year. We couldn't get to the park on the road because they were working on the bridge for actually like two seasons. Um, so that group just never really kept going just because of, uh, of that reason and like other reasons too. But what we really want to do is to form a group, a formal group that's going to speak for broader Park and hopefully we can come on when we're at the end and talk a little bit more about it. Yeah, I hope so. Um, and again, we encourage everybody just uh, keep referring folks to the news section of our website uh, where we, we dig in deeper into uh, the kind of the get to know you parts of slow roll. Some some folks, uh, you know, are, are, who are in, we're having conversations in the front of the pack. Some folks in the back of the pack aren't hearing, and we we're really uh, uh, big on these opportunities to say like, not just you know, don't just take the ride. Like, go onto the website and read about all the people we're partnering with and that are riding with us. And this virtual slow roll is another way to continue these conversations. Um, so we're here we're uh, on Hamburg Street now. We are going over uh, the railroad tracks uh, downtown over there. See the skyline. Uh, these are rough roads. Uh, we'll continue to call uh, on the city to 
improve them. Both Hamburg and Louisiana, these overpasses uh, to get over uh, Exchange Street, the tracks, uh, and eventually go under the 190 here. These are just in uh, horrible condition. Um, but uh, this is the way, if you're uh, on a bike, this is the best way to get to the water, to get to the first ward, which will be uh, the valley in the first ward, the other side of this hill. Uh, and and eventually we're making it down to the Buffalo River where Hamburg Street ends. Uh, and as we get there, uh, so that we can continue the conversations uninterrupted, just ask folks to keep an eye out as we're uh, for, for going further down Hamburg. There's a couple crosswalks here. We'll give a shout out to Rebecca Riley and the crew at, with Go Bike Buffalo uh, with those traffic calming measures for pedestrian safety. There's a brand new one that will pass here. Uh, we'll be stopped at the light uh, at Hamburg and South Park. And then there's another one at Hamburg and O'Connell Street. Uh, Rebecca and the crew, as we discussed last week uh, on the Bikes Over Bailey ride with Rebecca, Rebecca really went in on this, the process of uh, installing crosswalks in, in a citizen-led process, something that most cities count on the city hall to take care of. Uh, city hall does some of it, the folks in the Department of Public Works, they're not getting to it enough to meet the needs of the citizens of, of Buffalo. Go Bike is stepping into that void and has a process for engaging the community on deciding uh, where to go with the resources that they have. Uh, so there are a few of these in the first ward. And when we continue around here on our way back through downtown to the west side, we'll, see, we'll be riding on a bike lane that was just repainted last week by Go Bike Buffalo, as Rebecca discussed last week. And we are so grateful for the work that Go Bike does. It extends beyond bicycling into pedestrian safety uh, right here at this intersection. Boom, look at that. Um, and shout out to on the left is Underground's Cafe and Sarah Heidinger, the owner there. And uh, was it her mom? I think maybe her mom and aunt was, were out painting those crosswalks together. Uh, so it's always, it's, it's a, a community, uh, a collaboration everywhere that there is a new crosswalk painted by Go Bike. Chris, why don't you guide us from here uh, on our way to uh, Mutual Riverfront Park and, and, uh, and why you wanted to include this uh, in this particular ride? Yeah, thanks, Seamus. Um, we're, we're heading down Hamburg into the uh, first board. And you know, Buffalo River was where we got our start as an organization um, that was just just a grassroots kind of community group of friends uh, coming together, and they were the friends of the Buffalo River, and we were you know they formed a nonprofit, but they were basically just you know we didn't have staff for the first like twelve years of our organization with just these folks advocating for. The Buffalo River being restored. Um, the river was dead in 1968. The river caught on fire. Um, we have, you know, it's the it's it's basically like the river was part of the industrial process um, for over uh, a century, pretty much uh, since more than a century uh, since uh, the Buffalo River became the what made us the, the biggest grain port in the world and, and one of the biggest second biggest lumber ports and and shipment um, that came through and all the, the wealth they created for not for everybody but for for some um, but a lot of the, the ideas of that of all of these uh, steel chemicals buffalo color the indigo dye they made um, republic steel lots of lots of industry and um Toxins were in the bottom of the river, and the river is completely devoid of any access and any like life, and, and at least before the Clean Water Act was passed. But um, when we came together, Waterkeeper was one of the first. It was Riverkeeper at the time was one of the first nonprofits to work on an area of concern. So there's 46 of these spots throughout the Great Lakes because you know the Great Lakes was. Uh, kind of like big into the chemical and steel and, and extractive, you know, fossil fuel based industries for most of the 20th century. And we're one of 46 areas of concern. Uh, we actually have three 
in, in our area. The Niagara River is actually an area of concern as well and 18 Mile Creek in Lockport. So Buffalo Water Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper was the, the point on the area of concern and we organized all the federal, uh, state, uh, responsible parties, a few responsible parties that were that were around that hadn't gone bankrupt and you know not had liability on, on the chemicals that they created and dumped in the river. Um, it led to dredging. And now we're at the foot of Hamburg Street um, Mutual Riverfront Park, which didn't exist when I started at Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper in, in 2011. Um, and so once the, the river was clean, we, uh, after the dredging of the river, um, we're working on restoring, uh, we did eight shoreline restoration sites. So where the water meets the land is the, the best place for wildlife and people. So we're trying to uh, take away those metal walls and make a natural slope water so you know, animals can get down to the water, birds can get down to the water, people can get down to the water, um, and, and uh, creating public access. So um, our big biggest project in the Buffalo River after the shoreline restoration sites is what we call the Buffalo Blue Way. Um, so we're really looking to make the Buffalo River a, uh, a water trail. So in a water trail is where you have water access in different points, um, and it doesn't just mean kayaking or boating, but it's also a, a land, you know, base connection as well. Um, so people can access the water, people can, you know, paddle, people can bike, people can fish. So we're, we're enhancing existing public access and we're creating new public access in several locations. Um, so we're going to work on 10 sites um, over the next, uh, it's been about a five year project. So that's, that's our biggest thing with the Buffalo River right now. Um, but like we talked about, what we talked about before um, about the inequity environmental analysis that um, India was talking about, we really have to evolve um, as environmental organization too. And, and, and we're, we're learning that, like I'm learning, you know, and that we used to think like water, everybody needs water, everybody needs access to water. So if we're if we're creating access to water, if we're protecting clean water, it's gonna benefit everybody. But it doesn't benefit everybody equally if you don't intentionally try to uh, make sure that it doesn't just benefit the folks that always have benefited more. You know what I'm saying? So so we have to be intentional about where the investments are, what, where we're putting our energies and, and pumping from the work. So that, that's what we're, we're dealing with as a, as a movement. And, and we're, we're, like we said, we're having those, those tough conversations and, and not stopping that. It's not everybody put out their, um, Black Lives Matter statement in the height of, of after the murder of George Floyd and we're making sure, like I'm making sure, people at Helen's making sure that we're not, that's not just a statement that's put out, you know, one time without any follow through. It's a, it's a change in, in the environmental movement and we're, we're making sure that that happens. So I just want to make sure that we talk about that on this little role. Appreciate that, Chris. Uh, it's a conversation we're here for uh, and you know, uh, we've had the, those conversations plenty of times on just riding together. And again, uh, we're, we're, that's why we're continuing this virtual floral outlet because not only are there so many people who uh, are not riding with us who usually would, we're, we're talking about two groups here uh, splitting into groups of uh, 50 or less. We had about maybe 75, 80 people on this ride uh, all together into two groups when we usually would have 1,500, 2,000, and we would be carrying out this conversation. So we're having this conversation virtually now, not only for the folks who would be with us and are missing this and showing these scenes, but just one more outlet to continue these necessary and often uncomfortable conversations. India, I pulled a clip from our 
community land trust ride back in June uh, and put it uh, on our YouTube channel of you really, I really loved how you broke down uh, equity and how we have to, how we have to achieve it really. I like the way Chris says it, but how intentional we have to be about understanding uh, the difference between equality and equity and, and how the, the former is, can't be achieved without the latter, right? Right. Um, it's interesting, you know, that Chris sort of tied in the, the political moment that we're in with the happenings with, with George Floyd and just the, the exhaustion um, of a nation with uh, not only police brutality, but with systemic racism. And we're really coming to a moment um, of both awakening and, and reckoning, um, right? Like how do we actively undo, right? It's one thing to acknowledge the harm that's been done. And it's one thing to put policies in place that are equal, but how do you actively undo the harm that's been caused? And that's where, we, where the equity conversation comes in, right? If you have people who started at zero, right? And then you have people who started at negative 10, you owe those people who started at negative 10, that 10 to bring them to zero before we can ever have a conversation about equality. And we, we live in a place where for many people um, that doesn't exist. Um, I'm, I'm here in, in DC right now um, for the, the commitment march. It is the 57th anniversary of the March on Washington. And you know, our forefathers and ancestors fought for civil rights and the Voting Rights Act. And, you know, the original March on Washington was the, the march for jobs and freedom. And still today, in 2020, we are asking for the same damn thing. Excuse my language. Um, you know, as far as we've come, we still have so much further to go. Um, and we can't let up off the gas. We are in a very particular moment where there's opportunity to see substantive, sustainable change. Um, and I think that we need to embrace that. We need to embrace words like radical. Um, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes the condition of our communities, the state of our people requires radical change requires brave vision, bold vision and action. Um, and I think that this is a ride that demonstrates bold vision and bold action, right? When Riverkeeper started, like no one was really paying attention to, to what was wrong with the Buffalo River, right? Like it was a tool of industry. Um, when, when Helen was experiencing a lack of upward mobility and not seeing opportunities to grow her leadership, she created something. So we're seeing this culmination of people who are just fed up and tired of the status quo and who are doing something to, to, to make things better. Seamus, you, you talked to me, was it you talked to me about curb cuts? And about how like curb cuts, they seem like such a, a nominal thing, right? But they benefit so many people. We may do it for one population and believe that that's who it benefits, but it makes things better for everyone. And that's what equity does, right? What you do for the least of the people benefits the most people, right? The trickle down doesn't work. We know that. Um, but when you start from the bottom and work your way up, that is where you really see communities change, quality of life change. So I'm just, I'm excited. Um, I know that like it's, it's heavy. There's so much going on. It's easy to get like sort of down in the dumps and feel hopeless. But I think that like, this is our moment. Um, and this is when we, we rise to the occasion. Well, it's a moment all right, as we are in the cobblestone district we're, uh, thanks, Mark. This is a little new thing that we're going to do. I won't have to uh, narrate the ride as much, guide the ride, because Mark's putting little street signs in on the lower right corner. Mark Odian uh, producing the broadcast for us here. So we're on Perry Street. And, uh, of course, uh, the big arena to the left. What we were doing on the ride here is I, I want to touch on this because it is related to what you just said, India. Uh, we're we're going to turn right on Washington and we're going to head in that hotel there, 
uh, is uh, a couple teams full of professional baseball players uh, who are uh, the Toronto Blue Jays are playing their games in Buffalo this season because of the complications of uh, having Major League Baseball in a pandemic and international uh, sports. We're going to ride up just past the ballpark where, as we speak right now, was scheduled to be a ball game uh, between the Blue Jays and the Boston Red Sox, and it was postponed out of a uh, out of respect uh, for what is happening in our country. Uh, that the uh, uh, Milwaukee Bucks led the way on this, uh, being the closest to Kenosha, Wisconsin, which is where the spotlight is right now on this uh, uh, great awakening we're talking about. Uh, but it is just transcending so much of our society right now. Uh, and so where we were riding by, they were, it was an off night here on Monday, but uh, the Red Sox came to town and they are not playing right now. And we know a lot of people feel strongly in a lot of different directions about that, but make no mistake, it is part of a national moment. And it is, it is hitting every part of our society, whether some folks like it or not. And where it relates here to what we're talking about on a waterkeeper ride is why Helen's perspective is just so powerful here. Helen, you are uh, just, again, just graduated, got your undergrad. So uh, really intrigued by your perspective uh, where you're coming into the professional world and what, what Chris is talking about, about uh, a, a change that is beginning in uh, the environmental justice uh, field. How are you observing and participating in this as someone who's just stepping into this professionally? Um, I definitely look at it as starting from the ground up. I know a lot of people think of advocacy and, and wanting to get their point across by, oh, you know, write to the governor or write to the state or, you know, whoever's in charge, your mayor even. I'm not saying that's the wrong thing to do, but you need that support. You need that local support of your next door neighbor or the, the group of people a couple blocks over because that makes your voice louder. And that's something that I always like to talk about for every Be Well event that we have is that you're not alone. Like this is you can talk about anything as long as you're respectful and kind, but we're all working towards the same goal is to just have a better community and a, a better place for, for everyone. So I guess coming into this, that's, that's where my view is at, is starting from the bottom and working your way up instead of trying to go head first into the, the biggest issues. Can you guys hear me okay? My screen froze a little bit. Now yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, I hope I hope that answered your question well enough. But that's definitely where where my views are. I mean, because I I feel like far too often, like Chris said, we're we're not even a a part of this discussion. Like um, you know, minority communities, women, people who often aren't seen in these environments, and our, our voices aren't just as important as the next person's, if not more, because it, it impacts our communities more than anyone. Yep, I have I have a saying that I got from my friends in Oakland. I think I might say it every single show that we do together, Seamus. <laughs> Those closest to the problem are closest to the solution, right? The, the people know what they need, where they live. Like, there's no mm -hmm. one who's a better expert on what people want but most importantly what people need than the people who need it themselves right mm -hmm. um so we, we really have to like place more value on folks experiential expertise and and lived experiences when, when we are looking for policy solutions and you know I'm, I'm really proud of the work that we do in buffalo we have a long way to go but we have really dug our heels in and um you know, have lots of community-based organizations and nonprofits who really are centering the most impacted and the most marginalized and the most unheard people in the work. Right on, and I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, Chris, here as we uh, we ride past uh, County Hall. Uh, we are downtown, 
and we're going to make a left on Niagara and go through Niagara Square. And at some point soon after that, we're going to jump ahead to the uh, to the end of the ride where Chris has some great footage of us uh, pulling into Broderick Park and that beautiful sunset. But as we approach Niagara Square here, looking at City Hall, Chris, can you describe how uh, this work obviously needs to involve City Hall? How has the city of Buffalo been over the years and in, into the present on, uh, on supporting uh, the work of Waterkeeper? Um, well, the city, this, the, the city has been very supportive of our work um, and we're, we, they need to be because we're, you know, we're improving, we're improving the city and we're improving the waterfront um, and creating, you know, a, a destination where people want to go. So if they weren't, uh, you know, good partners with us, it would, it would be wrong. <laughs> but um, the city is also like a land, the landowner on a lot of uh, the projects that we work on. So, you know, that, that cooperation has to happen. Um, but we, we also have to coordinate with federal and state as well, like the folks like the Army Corps of Engineers and the DEC. Um, so, and, and folks don't always see eye to eye um, on when you have all these different entities. So Waterkeepers kind of prides ourselves as being like the convener of figuring out how to make, make everybody agree with each other just to get the, the project done and improve the water quality. So, so that's a skill set that we have to have in that environment. And it's, it's not a, uh, something you learn in school or anything. It's just more like a mediation and, and uh, but I mean, everybody, all our partners that we work with have been great, um, you know, at all levels. So we couldn't do it like alone, you know, obviously like we were, we'd like to say that we are the lead of things, but we couldn't, you know, we couldn't do it by, our, by ourselves. Um, and I just, I know we're wrapping up. I just wanted to um, go back to what India said about the that curb cut effect and how everybody benefiting from what you do for the, the least, uh, the most vulnerable people. Um, and I just like to say that I think we could benefit like the environmental movement because it's missing so, so many different perspectives. Like we can only benefit, we're missing out on all that possible innovation or creativity that could come from folks that have been, you know, not welcomed and and have a lot of barriers to, to, them, to them becoming part of our movement. Um, so so we have to do everything we can once again. So I, I really like that point of the curb cut effect. Seamus froze, so he's our leader, so I don't know where, <laughs> <laughs> where we go from here. <laughs> um, I think that we're going to, I think we're probably going to jump ahead, like he said, because the, the GoPro ran out, and um, and Helen and I took a little bit of a shortcut, uh, so <laughs> we finished the ride a little bit before <laughs> the groups. So... So I was able to film the two different groups coming in. So I think Shay was going to put that, that footage in. Um, but we could talk a little bit about Broderick Park because I think, I don't know if Mr. George, he probably had like th three or four other meetings or something to go on. Um, but here you see we're at Broderick Park, um, people coming over the the, uh, lift rail, the lift bridge over the Black Rock Canal. And... Uh, Coming in here, Seamus is doing his thing. So at uh, Broderick Park, we've to me Broderick Park is is has the most the most diverse crowd of any park that I've seen in Buffalo. It's everybody, like every kind of person uh, that you can imagine, <laughs> speaking all different languages, um, looking all different different ages, um, ethnicities, races. Like I think it's just a really great park. Um, and we want to keep it the way it is and we want to improve it and we want to make sure that it has um, like equitable maintenance um, compared to other city parks. We want to improve like amenities like the bathrooms, make sure that the bathrooms are open longer, like just basic things. Um, we're doing, we want to make sure the gardens are beautiful to welcome everybody um, because like George always says, it's sacred ground, um, the terminus of the Underground Railroad in Buffalo where 
people that were seeking their freedom from the South made it here and would travel to the Black Rock Ferry. Um, and we have, and I will not do it justice, of course, because we have some really um, special like storytellers in our group that are also work with the, the Michigan Avenue corridor. And um, eventually we want to have a lot of programming down here when we can gather again and, and have those those things in the past and events and, and plays and music and um, we have a really great amphitheater built right into the you can see it when the camera swings over but we could have a lot of performances and plays and, and just really dig into this history that we don't learn none of us learn i went to buffalo public schools and i didn't learn about broderick park being the underground railroad or that harriet tubman lived in st catherine's part of her family, like I never learned that stuff. So uh, we had to tell those stories and you can see the sunset um, is a great spot for the sunset too. It's amazing. Good job, Chris. I put you on the spot to uh, guide the ride. Um, but um, that's part of the fun of, of, uh, of our virtual <laughs> floral here. <laughs> you know, virtual floral is like a box of chocolates. Uh, you never know who's going to disconnect. The, uh, <laughs> But I, I knew you were capable. This, uh, it, it, you've done so much work here, uh, not only with Waterkeeper, but extending that to these Saturday mornings. So in the absence of George, uh, the, to, we want to plug that Saturday morning cleanup um, that we used that picture of you. Uh, so uh, riding your bike with a trailer full of tools. Tell us about Saturday mornings in Broderick Park. For the past um, month or so, no, two months or so, we've been gathering 10 to 12 every Saturday morning um, just to work on the gardens. There's the uh, Lillian Bachelor in honor of Miss, uh, Miss Lillian Bachelor, who was started the Buffalo Quarters, which did a lot of the, the historical research. Um, and they used to do reenactments of the Underground Railroad um, there. And it, the, the garden was, it was neglected, like it was very neglected. So we needed to, we pruned, we weeded, we edged, um, we, and it's a beautiful garden. It's got roses and, and lilacs and like really flowering shrubs, but we're gonna plant more um, perennials and native plants to attract butterflies and, and beautify it more. Um, and um, we're having, the Hellenist group is actually joining us because we're gonna be getting a large donation of mulch from our partners at Rich Products, and we're going to be spreading mulch in the beds to, to keep them good for the winter so that there won't be a ton of weeds to come up in the spring. But yeah, it's just to getting together, getting out, um, socially distant, of course, wearing our masks the whole time. And uh, and, and George always comes, you know, he's always there. And, and um, uh, Miss Candace Moppins and her um, daughters from the Delvin Grider Community Center have been coming almost every week. So shout out to Candace. She, she does, uh, and, and they were in our close to our neighborhood where we started the Slow World of Delvin Grider, and they do a they're doing a lot of great work over there. Um, but yeah, so uh, probably till the end of September, we'll be there every Saturday, ten to twelve. But anybody's welcome to come and join us. Beautiful and oh. We Go ahead. We have Facebook too. Uh, Friends of Broderick Park has a Facebook. We don't have a website, but we have a Facebook and Instagram. Um, if we're trying to get more followers on it. Uh, Friends of Broderick Park on Facebook. And, and going a little bit north here, uh, I want to point out for the cyclists as well that uh, this path, this is kind of a funny freeze frame to finish on, but uh, if you continue on this path straight ahead there, you can ride along the water to Unity Island. And uh, Helen, that's where uh, you and the Be Well crew uh, were out on, on a Saturday last week, right? Tell us about that. Yeah, it, it was amazing yet sad at the same time, to be completely honest, because in about an hour and a half, we collected 228 pounds of garbage. There was about maybe 20, 25 of us there. And... Um, you know, to, to tie in with Waterkeeper, we submitted that data. I don't know if you saw it, but I I wanted to like write in all caps because I 
couldn't believe how much was picked up from that park. And I was just really glad that we did it on a Saturday evening when there are a lot of families there, when there are a lot of people from the community just kind of hanging out because, you know, if they show up every time after the trash has been cleaned up, nobody's going to realize that it's it's a community effort to keep it clean. So, you know, there were some people walking up and like handing us their garbage and things like that, which is one step closer than, you know, just leaving it on the ground, leaving it behind. So, yeah, I I'm really glad we had that event and I hope we have many more cleanups to come because it, I think it really impacted a lot of people. So well, I haven't been to the island in quite a while. Are, are there enough trash cans there? Um, yes and no. Um, <laughs> Go ahead, yeah, Chris. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, it's a big park um, and there's some big, there's some big gatherings uh, of folks going on there and they're the trash cans could fill up but they're also it's so spread out too that like it's a, it's a huge park and and the trash cans are only you know at certain spots so um yeah it's tough with the litter we've been like i said we've been doing the cleanups for 30 years and at the same time we're trying to you know push for advocacy for policies that'll reduce you know, single use items and things like that. Um, and it's like gonna take a multi-pronged approach of that, of education, of students that do our cleanup, little kids that do our cleanups, it, after their parents say that they become, you know, like vigilant against litter, like they always want to pick up litter. So if we have education programs with, with young folks to start them, you know, down the path of, of not litter picking up. I mean, that's, I don't know, it's going to take a lot. I can't figure it out. I, it's a long lifetime goal to stop littering, but. Yeah. Well, well you're... you did know that I still snip the little plastic rings that come on a six pack. <laughs> I, I learned that in like third grade. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> well, and, and that I think is an interesting point when you guys talk about education that uh, that is a message that got through so well that those of us of a certain age, uh, you know, uh, that it was, uh, uh, refresh me here, Chris, was it um, that it was uh, ducks were getting caught in it, right? Birds were, were getting caught in that. And, yeah. and that was, the, that was the, the turtle straw scenario of, uh, of, the, uh, of our generation when we were kids, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and um, speaking of that, at Friends of Broderick Park, a couple, maybe like a month ago, just their time goes by and I don't realize it, uh, we saved a bird, uh, a Caspian tern, actually, a water, one of our waterfall, migratory waterfall that was tangled up with fishing line. And it was horrible. And, it, and we saved it. It was a big effort. It was, it was very dramatic. <laughs> and it, it had like a big fisherman help. Like random people helped. Some guy was taking pictures, and the uh, Candace Muffin's uh, daughters helped. And we were just like adamant because it was ten feet down in the water, and you couldn't go try it. And I took it to a wildlife rehab. But the fishing line is a big issue with the wildlife, so we installed uh, through our no. We have a grant from NOAA from Marine Debris. We installed a, a fishing line recycling station to where you fishermen can put their line when they cut it off instead of leaving it around because it just tangles around everything and, and, and then they, they can't fly and it, it's terrible. It's really amazing the amount of work and the, the breadth of the work uh, that y'all do at Waterkeeper. We could go really all night with so many things that we haven't even brought up yet. Uh, uh, the uh, translation of, uh, of guidance for uh, people fishing on the waterways, as you mentioned, uh, you know, we, we know that the West Side is amazingly diverse with people from all over the world, especially people coming from Asia who are used to living off of fishing and, and not yet aware when they come here that uh, of the, the, the state, uh, the, the polluted state of these waterways. There is just so much work that Waterkeeper does to protect, promote the waterways and, and educate us. I, if if we just have to leave it off for now, guys, uh, I, I would love to just leave with the two of you, uh, uh, Helen and Chris, 
the how can how can we stay in touch? How can we get involved? Uh, how, you know, how can we learn more and, and continue to follow the work of uh, Helen Be Well Community and Chris with Waterkeeper? Yeah, um, I guess I'll go first. <laughs> so um, Be Well, we have a website, uh, the acronym B W E L L dot community. Um, we also have an email you can contact, bewell.community.ny at gmail.com, um, and a Facebook page, Be Well Community, Instagram, Be Well Community. Just type our name in anywhere, and you will find us. We will respond. <laughs> thanks, Helen. And um, thanks so much for joining us, too. It was great. Thank you for uh, having me, honestly. <laughs> awesome. So ours is, you know, www.bnwaterkeeper.org. And then has, we have a lot of things like pop up when you go to our homepage, but then there's a get involved tab to like for all the different uh, volunteer events. Uh, we have just to promote, we're doing Skajakwita September. Uh, we couldn't have any fundraisers this year in person. We were counting like three or four person fundraisers. Uh, we're doing a virtual fundraiser um, in September, so we're doing a bunch of events, and then we have an auction. Um, but we have a big cleanup um, all throughout Skjakwita, even on the water, kayaks, um, on uh, September 19th, and you can, you can sign up for that on our website. I don't think it's, it might not be live yet, I think it's going live like September. Um, we're going to need groups of people to clean up um, on the lower Skjakwita, um, and we're looking, I haven't made a connection again, but I'm sure I can make some um, connections to do uh, some, some spots on the east side in the buried section as well, just like we did, because we didn't, we didn't do as much as we needed to do the, the other day. Um, and up in the upper watershed too. But, but stay involved, um, vote, register your friends to vote, and vote for people that have policies to protect clean water and promote environmental justice. And we can't endorse candidates, obviously, but uh, as a nonprofit, but vote for you know people that are going to do the right thing for the environment. Right on. Uh, well, uh, I'm voting for you for one of our, our best partners, Chris. I uh, really appreciate uh, all of the, the presence you've had on Slow Roll and the support in so many ways. Um, and, and so thank you for uh, uh, supporting us so much that uh, we can have this whole ride dedicated to y'all uh, and introducing us to so many folks along the way. Helen, uh, a favorite new friend. Uh, we are all going to keep in touch. Appreciate you keeping it uh, going right through to the virtual floral. So encourage everybody at home to follow along with Be Well Community, Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper. There's so much more to come. Uh, so before we announce our plans for the uh, next Monday's ride, uh, we will say goodnight to you all, Helen and Chris, and keep in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you, and India will make that kayak happen. We'll take you out on kayak. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Uh, yeah, the kayaking is such a big part of the work and one of the more fun parts of it, India. Anytime you want to go out, let me know. So, uh, Mark, let's call it up. Next Monday's ride, we are going to stay with the sunset on the water theme. We really did enjoy how this ride ended as the sun set over the river into Canada. Um, and uh, it really, Buffalo is uh, so fortunate to have these views. It's pretty uh, unique for the region to be able to watch the, the sun set into the water. Um, it's a big part of uh, why so many people live around here, our, our proximity to the water. So we are going to the Outer Harbor the next time. And um, so Monday, uh, August 31st, we're calling it the Southside Summer Sunset Ride, um, all about alliteration. We're gonna start it at the Niagara Frontier Food Terminal, which was our original venue with, that we had planned from back uh, over the winter uh, to be on August 31st, Niagara Frontier Food Terminal, uh, a really amazing space, Art Deco design that's almost 100 years old itself. Uh, so many interesting tenants there. At, uh, right at the corner of Clinton and Bailey. Notice that we are announcing the end part of the ride. So that's a change uh, for the fifth and final ride of August. We haven't been announcing the end point, but we're listening to our riders. We're listening to the feedback from our squad as well and uh, making it a little easier to plan to join us. 
So a uh, little give and take because unfortunately we're still under those CDC guidelines of planning ways to reduce attendance. So we're going to announce the end point of the ride, which will be Wilkinson Point this coming Monday. But uh, we're going to extend the length of the ride. It'll be about a 15-mile ride starting at Niagara Frontier Food Terminal, going through Lovejoy, Kaisertown, into South Buffalo. And this route has been planned with some of those long stretches where we can not only enjoy all the sights and senses of these parts of town, but get those sunset views. We'll come over tipped from South Buffalo to the Outer Harbor and ride along Sherman Boulevard for the end of the ride as that sun is setting into Lake Erie. What are you thinking? Do you feel like joining us if it's going to be a little longer ride? As always, I'm going to start. We're all finished. The world may never know. <laughs> Well, we know that what, what an adventure it's been. So you didn't finish this past Monday, but you had an amazing experience even after you left the pack of slow roll. Yeah. Mason wanted to ride really, really bad. I didn't notice how big he got. A little kid bike and he really struggled. Um, so there were gentlemen who saw him struggling. They said, hey, like, can we get a bike? And they went and got a bike, brought it um, back to our house. That, that was really cool. Um, so shout out to Sharp and Big of Top Gun Motorcycle Club right down on Northland. That's right. And uh, and our squad member, Shan Anderson, is part of that crew as well. Uh, and uh, it, was just, it was so cool with the story that you posted afterward. Uh, and I was like, no, what happened to Indian Mason? Oh, they had a good time. <laughs> We did. So well, showing up and, you know, I I think that you are a little bit sort of feeling a little guilty about the inclusivity. But I, like I said, people just show up. Um, there's no pressure. Ride as far as you can. And, and when you need to drop off, drop off. And there's always going to be someone along the way to make sure that that you're OK. Yeah, uh, maybe there is a shade of guilt there, uh, especially having been raised uh, Irish Catholic. It's it's just always present. But um, th yeah, I just I, I'm just sad. I'm sad that we've had to compromise our inclusivity. It's it it's part of the adjustments to be able to still have rides in the state that we're in. So uh, we once again uh, look over to uh, these eight. Uh, elements of the ride that have changed uh, now and and that uh, in some way um, the first seven represent uh, a compromise of inclusivity. Uh, number one, we mouth and nose must be covered. Well, we know there are people uh, with respiratory issues who, who that is a struggle for. Um, and, and so we're going to lose some folks that way. Uh, number two, no round trip route. The ride ends in a different place then it begins. It's extending the mileage uh, of the ride. Uh, so many folks drive in uh, it, from all around the region uh, in order to participate, makes it harder for them. Uh, it's less inclusive. Uh, we, the start time is, is staggered, of course. Um, that's just splitting into groups, so it, it's not as inclusive in terms of the people riding together. We're breaking them up. Uh, the no after party is something that is special to us. Uh, when we, we continue these conversations after the ride, when we get back and, you know, we have a, we have a drink, we have something to eat and uh, that fellowship, uh, we have to enjoy some music and people are dancing. And, and that is just such a cherished part of it for so many people. We're missing that. Uh, no police motorcade. A lot of folks, that's something we never asked for. Uh, and, and in a lot of ways, uh, just it, it, it actually creates as much uh, problems for us, but uh, but we do have a lot of uh, officers who have been a great presence, and a lot of people uh, don't want to come because they don't feel as safe, even though our squad is working so hard to uh, manage those intersections. So uh, we know it's going to reduce attendance. It's also going to reduce our expenses. Uh, faster pace, la longer route, no scheduled stops. That makes it harder for, you know, our, this whole inclusivity is like you know making it easy for people of all skill levels uh, uh, of cycling to be able to participate. We're missing that, and uh, self-supported. So if you have a flat uh, of some sort of mechanical issue, we cannot promise that you will get the service.
that you have come to expect out of slow roll. But we wanted to end it on a nice note that we are reconnecting communities, reconnecting. We know that there are so many folks disconnected in so many ways already in Buffalo, but especially in this pandemic uh, when, we're, when we're ever more isolated. So we're here for the reconnection and virtual slow roll is here to stay connected. So with that, we, uh, we appreciate Mark Odian, WNYmedia.net for uh, all the technical assistance in pulling this off. We thank again, uh, Chris Morosky from Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper for being part of this and all the support, including introducing us to Helen Toledo and the Be Well community. We thank our presenting partner, Independent Health, for uh, all their support since 2015, uh, especially through all the challenges of this year as, as we were delayed three months to really get our season up and running uh, in person. And I thank you, India, for taking time to be part of this, not only joining our board, uh, but while you're down there in Washington for uh, a really exciting time uh, uh, for that march tomorrow that you are so deeply involved in, still taking time uh, to co-host this with us. We look forward to hearing about your experience down there and I uh, look forward to hearing that you get home safely and join us this coming Monday. Absolutely. I'll see you on Monday. I'd say hey to the boys. Thanks everyone at home for tuning in, in the present and the future. We would love to see you in person, Monday, August 31st, Niagara Frontier Food Terminal. Roll with us, Southside, Summer, Sunset Ride with Slow Roll. Peace.